What's unnatural about a plant? What's unnatural about something that someone produced in their laboratory? I mean, are there unnatural molecules? You know, anti-atoms? <laughs> Come on. But what, when we were looking at this in the, in the late 60s, no one had tried to use psychedelics for this kind of hard science problem. And, and if you went into the indigenous traditions, there was nothing there really either. Most of the indigenous traditions were using their psychoactive substances for diagnosis and divination, and almost always the major work was done by the shaman, not by the, the, the person coming in with the problem. And what we had going against us was the possibility that this really couldn't work because what we do know, and think of your own experiences, diminished capacity for logical thought processes, is that fair? <laughs> during, during the time of, of, of use, reduced ability to direct concentration, inability to control imagery, anxiety and agitation sometimes, constricted verbal and visual communication abilities, what's happening? <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Tendency to focus on inner events or personal issues. Let's talk about social justice. In 100,000 years, is that going to be an important issue? No, okay. <laughs> Lessened ability to describe your experience. Tendency to become absorbed in the visual complexity and visions. And if you say to someone, you know, would you be interested in solving this real world problem, there's a tendency to regard this world tasks as trivial. And therefore, why would you waste good psychedelic substance time on the trivia that dominates the rest of your life? Well, on the other hand, there's increased access to unconscious data. There's more fluent free association. There's increased ability to play spontaneously with hypotheses, paradoxes, transformations, etc. There's a heightened ability, obviously, for visual imagery and fantasy. Heightened relaxation and, op and, and openness. That's the opposite of anxiety. Either you're uptight or you're in bliss. That's, a, you know, that's the continuum. Uh, obviously, sensory inputs, way heightened. Heightened empathy with external processes, objects, and people. Um, you know, you, when you fall in love with a rock and you kind of get that it likes you. <laughs> so there's heightened awareness of experience. And in the problem solving realm, there's also an enhanced, it turns out, an enhanced sense of brightness the ability to see through false solutions and phony data, as well as lessened inhibitions and reduced tendency to, to censor ideas by premature judgment or negative judgments. And even in the, um, the MDMA world, you know, that's a fundamental relaxation where things can be fully experienced and reviewed and looked at, and in a sense, take that over into the hard science area and you can see where there's the advantage of that kind of lowering of, again, emotional barriers. And there's also heightened motivation promoted by suggestion and right set. And some of you have heard me say one of the reasons that, that my work has all been with synthetics is that synthetics are more easily, um, set and setting can be more important. You know, you really can't tell ayahuasca what you want it, want it to do because it says, you know, I'm so much smarter than you. And I've been around so much longer. Um, just throw up and listen. <laughs> but when you're using LSD um, or, or mescaline uh, or psilocybin uh, from the lab, you have some advantages. So. That's literally, and so the only variable, hard science here, the only variable we could meddle with was the heightened motivation um, promoting suggestion in the right set. So that's what we did. Now, how did you get into one of our studies? Actually, how could you get into the only study we were able to do? Because the government said, 
whoa, you're doing interesting work, stop. <laughs> the problem had to matter. Okay, a lot of people have asked me, gee, I have some problems I'd like to solve. And the answer is, how important is it? And you really had to be pretty obsessed to get into our study. And you had to have the necessary technical knowledge for such a problem. And one of our ways of testing that is, are you being paid to solve this kind of problem? And that suggested to us a reasonable level of competence. You've worked several months on the problem and failed. That's, that was one of our really, because when you fail on a problem and you know, and you're smart and you've spent 10 years in graduate school and blah, 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 that's hard. And you're getting paid for it. Now you got extra credit if you're angry at yourself, your company, or the client. Because <laughs> what we were really looking at is people who were who really wanted to solve that problem. That was their issue, okay? It's a little bit like people who go down to Peru and they have a serious disease. Their motivation is really clear. They are not there to have a good time. They are not there to have a pleasant experience. They are there to save their lives. That's the kind of motivation, you know, we weren't quite at that level, but we were pushing. Now, what kind of problems did we did, did basically our scientists come in with? Let me just give you a quick list of a sample. Photoconductivity decay processes. Hold your excitement. <laughs> New design of a vibratory microtome. Space probe experiments to measure solar properties. Improvement, this is the 60s, improvement to magnetic tape recorder. A dining room chair design. It turns out in the furniture design world, dining room chairs are the hardest because they are seen from all sides and they have to be incredibly durable. Um, so it turns out that's a good, difficult problem. Mathematical theorems regarding Nordate circuits. Uh, this is something that's used in chip design. A conceptual model of the photon and then we had a couple of wonderful architects design of a commercial building, design of a, prop, of a private home. And again, they had to have been working on it in, these, in, the, in the architecture ones, the client had been refusing things. Uh, the private home, what he said is we'd spent hundreds of hours, our office was losing money hand over fist with this client. It met our criteria. We had 44 problems attempted and no solution for four of them, okay? Then I want to read you a little bit from the description of what people were doing. Now, I, these are basically all this is taken from my book and there's lots more in the book. That's not, well, it is promotional, okay. Um, but what I'm saying is that if you are seriously interested, um, there's a lot more of what I'm talking about. Uh, particularly with these much, much longer descriptions of what people were literally doing uh, as they reported to us later. And this is from one of the architects. My experience during the session was an unbelievable increase in the ability to concentrate and make decisions. It was impossible to procrastinate. Cobwebs, blocks, and, blo and binds disappeared. Anything was possible. But I was working on real and rather tight problems. The designs were freer, but probably more from the standpoint of removing blocks in the consideration of what the client might accept. Three designs were outlined in three hours. All were accepted by the clients. Okay? That little wow is all of you that deal with such things. The two houses referred to are now complete, and I feel very successful. They're freer than my more usual work, but not untypical. The clients would be horrified if they knew the history of the conceptual design. <laughs> Then, I think right now the clients would say, oh, that's cool. <laughs> Let me join you and let's both go over the design. <laughs> this is definitely an enhancement of the ability to visualize, but my experience was, and this is the name, that, that I became a better Heinrich Bull and was not converted to an, converted to an instant Gaudi. So what he's saying is he really did a better job of being himself. Uh, another piece here. The simplest problem 
was attacked first. Almost immediately, several relationships that had escaped my attention became apparent, apparent and a solution to the spatial relationships followed soon after. I avoided looking at a watch, but I would guess about 20 minutes elapsed. Normally, I would stew and fret for weeks before coming to such a solution. Don't misunderstand me. On a simple problem, the period at the end, which is productive, is often quite short, but in any case, a matter of hours. And then later on in the afternoon, having made some solutions, he said, at this point I said to myself, it would not be fair to Barney not to give his house one more try. That was the bad client. The only scheme which excited him was too much money, but he didn't lose face. This time my approach to the problem was unrelated to all the previous attempts, and I looked at the challenging site in a new way. I really believe the solution that resulted in a few minutes is better than those that preceded it. This was a job that had taken several hundred hours. So, good, right? And it commented again, I showed the sketches to the client a few days later, they were approved. Three, year, three weeks later, I prepared working drawings. I put, but I put my sketch pad, he'd made a huge number of sketches during the afternoon, I kept my sketch pad closed on the desk beside me. A few hours later, after the first dimensional sheet was done, I compared it with the original. It was almost exactly the same. I had, without scaling the original sketches, laid out three acres of buildings, parking, outdoor theater, walls, patios, in the exact dimensions, and kept it in my head as clearly as it had been. What happened is he actually saw the whole building completed, so much that he walked around in it. He went out and counted the parking spaces, which were totally correct. He looked at the way the beams had been laid, and what size bolts, it was that level. So what he says is, I'd kept it in my head as clearly as it had been when I walked through it. So he didn't use any of his sketches to do the hard drawings, because he'd been in the building. Um, here's a different one. I decided to drop my old line of thinking and give it a new try. The mystery of the easy dismissal and forgetting did not strike me until later because I'd many times had managed to work the whole thing into an airtight deadlock that I'd been unable to block. See, this is why we like these people, because there's an emotional component there that's very important. They cared, they'd suffered. I dismissed the original idea entirely and approached it differently. Then things began to happen. All kinds of different possibilities came to mind and I quickly sketched them out. Each new sketch produced other possibilities and new ideas. I began to work quickly, almost feverishly, to keep up with the flow of ideas. Okay? You're getting, I want you to get the, the, the texture of this rather than the content. Uh, this is one from an engineer. Uh, he was, the formation of a visual image corresponding to the heat distribution of an object, such as the human body. <laughs> Application for medical diagnosis since disease tends to have a higher temperature than surrounding tissue. Another insight at this point was the most efficient way to do this, and some of you may not follow all this, an expansion of gas that was superior to other, any other operation. I visualized the two thin film layers formed by vacuum evaporation spaced at about the wavelength of yellow light. Many pneumatic cells of this shape um, can be formed this way. If the thermal image is projected on the array, the temperature reacted by each cell wall will determine the pressure of the gas and the consequent elastic deformation of the thin films. Um, I want you to get the level of complexity of intellectual, intellectual thought that was going on. And this is the way he thinks. Um, let me skip a little here. from a lovely man, scrutinized the modus operandi with which I attacked the problem. You just gotta love people like that. Realized that my mind was looking, working like a computer and although I could not visualize the local level operation, all known constraints about the problem were simultaneously imposed as I hunted for possible solutions. Um, I think that's pretty good. So that's what we were doing.
um, and there's lots more of that. And what we were demonstrating is that if you're interested as a culture in doing good work, would you not use things that make it easier to do good work? And quoting uh, Julie Holland, uh, a wonderful phrase that I recommend to all of us, it is unethical not to be doing psychedelic research. It is unethical. And that's where we are. So now you have your kind of elevator sentence about all this. And the question is, <clears throat> if we look at what are the great breakthroughs in science that have changed the world, and were any of those related to psychedelics? The answer is yes. Uh, biology, DNA, uh, double helix, uh, Mullis's work on the reproduction of a tiny amount of biological material, and in the science area, what we would call basically the computer revolution. And uh, there's a wonderful book, What the Dormouse Said, which is saying, why did all the computer breakthroughs happen on the West Coast in Northern California <laughs> when all the computer heavies were on the East Coast? And he makes the case that if you take a place called Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park and you take a one mile radius, what you find is there was this overlap of psychedelics and scientists. And he makes a very strong case that that was what made the revolution happen. And this is before Steve Jobs you know, told us about himself and so forth. And before all those companies went to Burning Man for a week and hung out with each other. So there's a lot, in a sense, going on in the culture. And what I'm doing with this kind of work is bringing back the notion that we can maximize the successful nature of creative problem solving in the hard science areas if we understand really how powerful and effective set and setting is. And I said, remember, we, we could manipulate that. And we had no idea that this would work, OK? We just really, uh, one of us, which is Willis Harmon, full professor of electrical engineering at Stanford, said he hoped it would work. And he, that's, he was the, the force behind it. And people like me thought, man, everybody's just going to trip. I love it when I'm wrong. And, but we told everybody, the first group, this is going to work. This is fantastic. You're going to have the best time of your life. We did everything we could to push set and setting. And we got them excited. And these are, of our 28 people, I think 26 had had no psychedelic experience. Um, well, this was the 60s. You could be a scientist and not have psychedelic experience. <laughs> it's harder, I'll tell you. <laughs> and we, we also administered some psychological creativity tests. Summing up that, everybody did better. Nobody ever cares about the results of any of those. Uh, but, you know, if you've got to have a measurement. So we no longer think you have to have a measurement. You just have to have success. And they had some terrific breakthroughs, and we thanked them, and they were taken home by their sitters. And then we all danced around the room, <laughs> saying, it really worked. It's really true. <laughs> Everything we told those guys was exactly spot on. And then the other groups were really easy, particularly because we began to have people calling us and saying, my lab buddy was in your study last week. Um, particularly, this was the group doing the Norgate mathematical stuff and don't ask me a question in the after what I'm talking about because I don't know. Um, but that group said he came back so excited and with so many interesting ideas, can I sign up? And I think we actually had a couple more of those guys through. So um, let me hold off here. Uh, we have some time for questions and answers and